Hey folks, and welcome to part two of the Integument Lecture. We're going to focus on the higher bilateria in this half of the lecture, um, specifically the vertebrata and the transitions their integument has gone through as they've moved from a marine lifestyle to a terrestrial lifestyle. All right. So we're going to start by talking about the commonalities that exist in the integumentary systems among basically all vertebrata. The integument of vertebrates has two principal layers. There's a deeper layer called the dermis. It's a thick <coughs> inner layer and it's derived from the mesoderm, unlike the epidermis, which is derived from the ectoderm, like what we're used to. Now the dermis serves as both an anchor and a growth medium for any structures associated with the integument. For example, skin and feathers, they're both anchored deep in the dermis and then they grow up through the epidermal layer and out onto the surface of the skin. Now, the epidermis is a significantly thinner layer of tissue than the dermis and you can see that in the diagram. So what's circled in red here, this upper layer, this is the epidermis. And notice it is not nearly as thick as the dermis, which goes all the way down. This is actually as low as I can draw with my tablet. <laughs> you can see the dermis is about five times as thick and it's home to a whole slew of different structures. The um, blue and red lines here are veins and arteries, so blood supply is in the dermis. It's the vascular layer of the skin. You can see the roots of hairs. You can see also glandular tissue is here, so this tube probably a sebaceous gland, meaning it allows oil to leave the glandular tissue down low. It exits through this tube and then spreads across the surface of the skin. Okay. So the dermis houses all of these complex structures while the epidermis provides protection for the body. Now we're going to start by talking about the dermis. It's made up of this meshwork of fibers. Many of them you saw before when we've talked briefly about uh, connective tissue. There are what we call collagenous fibers, which are made out of collagen, and they look like strands of braided rope. Okay, they're a single line of fibers that are woven around each other like that. Okay. They're made of protein and they are not stretchy. This is the structural material that gives the dermis its form, its shape. Now, elastic fibers are shaped very, very differently. Let me see if I can find one on here. Uh, it's very faint, but there's one there. They branch. Okay? They've got a lot of little intersecting pieces, and as their name implies, they're really stretchy. This is what allows your skin to be stretched over your body, and then when that part of your body relaxes again, the skin snaps back into its original shape. Otherwise, every time your skin would stretch, it would tear, which would not be very adaptive. Now, the organization of collagenous and elastic fibers in the skin of an animal is what determines its toughness or its elasticity. More collagen fibers, you're going to have really tough, really rigid skin, but it won't be stretchy. A lot of elastic fibers, and you'll have very stretchy skin, but it won't be very strong. It'll be thin and soft and easy to damage. Now, the dermis has two layers that we're going to worry about. That's it. There's the stratum compactum, which is the bottommost layer, and it provides cushioning. It absorbs any kind of shock that the body might be exposed to. So any impacts on the skin, that pressure is absorbed by the stratum compactum. Stratum means layer, or strata, like the Earth has different strata, different layers. Compactum means compact. Now, look at this area down here. Each of these lines that are stacked on top of each other, it's a layer of tissue. See how tightly these layers are connected to one another? There aren't any gaps in between them. That's why it's called compact. Now, the stratum spongiosum, it's above, closer to the surface of the body, the stratum compactum. It's all this up here. It's called spongy because there's a lot of white space. Anywhere you see white on a slide, that means the light can shine through it. It means there's nothing there, or there's very little there. All the tissue in this area is spread out, and there's a lot of gaps. It looks like the inside of a sponge. Okay? This is the layer of the dermis that is vascularized. So you see these are actually the cross sections of blood vessels. You get nerves up in here too, you get fat deposits, so this big thing, this is probably a fat deposit. 
This is also where you get pigment cells. So any coloration you see in the skin originates in the stratum spongiosum. Now the epidermis is a slightly different story. It's a lot thinner than the dermis, but it's heavily stratified, meaning it's got lots and lots of layers. I'm going to simplify this explanation because not all animals have all of these layers of epidermal tissue. Now, in general, all vertebrates have a stratum germinativum. Stra the stratum germinativum is the innermost layer. It's the deepest layer of the epidermis. It sits right on top of the dermis. And it's the layer that actually grows all your new epidermal cells. Your skin grows from the inside out. So as new cells are generated by the stratum germinativum, they move upwards. They're pushed upwards as more new cells grow beneath them. Now that stratum though is, if you look at it, it's only one cell layer thick. So while many of our lower animals in the bilateria, a lot of our pseudocelomates, even some of our coelomates, had an epidermis that was only one cell thick, meaning the entire epidermis, we have an epidermis that is many cells thick, but only one of them grows. So only our deepest layer of epidermis actually grows and generates new cells. Now, between the innermost stratum and the surface of the skin, there is, wrong way, there's a whole set of layers that we're just going to refer to as the secretion layers of the skin. And there's a bunch of them in here. So each of these different colors is a different layer that has oops, a different function to it. Okay, all of them. Now the secretion layers differ in different groups of vertebrates, which is why we're not going to spend a lot of time on them. But in general, I want you to know some of the functions the secretion layers have. In the secretion layers, you will find specialized cells called mucus cells. Mucus cells, unsurprisingly, produce mucus, right? It's a very watery, gooey material, serves a lot of different functions, mostly lubrication and water conservation. Mucus cells also produce toxic secretions. Now, the words toxic and poisonous are interesting when you're using them to describe animals. There's a lot of debate about whether the, the words actually have different meanings. In general, for our purposes, toxins are substances that can kill if they're ingested, but they aren't designed to, they're designed to deter. So they are, um, they taste bad, they smell bad, they make you go numb, they have a chemical mechanism whereby if you as an animal are eaten and you release those toxins, the predator that's eating you hopefully is either going to spit you out or you're going to die, but it will remember that you tasted horrible and it won't eat any other animals that look like you. It's hopefully saving the lives of your mates, your offspring, the rest of the animals in your community. You get toxic secretions from mucus cells. You also get, in some mucus cells, the production of um, small light generating materials. We call these photophores. We're going to talk more about them later. Okay? But they are light producing or light generating, sometimes by providing an environment in which light producing bacteria can survive. Now the other kinds of cells you find in secretion layers that I want you to worry about are called proteinaceous cells. They produce things that are based on proteins. Again, just like the name would imply. They produce, instead of mucus, something called slime. Now slime and mucus are actually different things. <laughs> mucus dissolves really easily in water. Slime doesn't. Slime takes a long time to break down. I'm going to show you a video later of, or I'll post a video of a hagfish Hagfish use slime as a self-defense mechanism. Proteinaceous cells also produce poisons. Poisons, unlike toxins, generally kill. They are meant to save the life of the individual and poison the predator that is trying to consume them. Okay? They are also used in things like venom. They're meant to kill a prey animal so that the predator can consume them. So spider venom, generally poisonous. Snake venom, also poisonous. The final thing that proteinaceous cells produce is another protein-based molecule called keratin. Like chitin, 
in arthropods, keratin is an incredibly important structural protein. Keratin is rigid, meaning it's really stiff, and it's insoluble. Insoluble meaning it will not dissolve in water, which is important since most vertebrates use it for waterproofing. Okay. It protects, usually, epithelial cells. So you find a keratin layer surrounding the cells in your upper epithelium, this area up in here. Now those keratin coverings of those cells make these uppermost layers of the epidermis really, really waterproof. Those keratin shells also stick around after the epithelial cells are dead. What you see up here, all of these what look like pancakes, these flattened out cells, aren't actually living cells anymore. They are the remains of dead cells. And what's left behind when an epithelial cell dies is its keratin coating. That keratin coating gets compressed as the organelles and the other stuff inside the cell falls apart. And it forms what we call the stratum corneum. It's dead, dry, and it's the outermost layer of skin. And it's uh, comprised primarily of keratin. Okay? It's a great way to waterproof your skin if you're a vertebrate. Now we're going to take a moment and talk about those pigment cells I mentioned that can be found in the dermis. Now pigment cells in animals are called chromatophores. Chroma, here, chroma means color. Okay? These are the cells that display the color of an animal's body. Now the kind of chromatophores you have can often be determined by what kind of metabolism you have, if you're what's called an endotherm or an ectotherm. So let's talk about those terms really quickly. Give us a blank slide to work with. All right. So endotherms, well, first of all, endothermy and ectothermy are terms we use to describe an animal's metabolism. Okay. Metabolism of an animal is generally defined as all the chemical, oops, sorry about that, I'm still learning, <laughs> reactions happening in the body that's it all the chemical reactions happening in the body all the time <laughs> we'll just keep the definition simple now your metabolism all of these chemical reactions produce one thing in common they could all be producing different molecules but they also all produce Heat. heat is the most common byproduct of chemical reactions in biology. Now think about this. If you have a metabolism that's very, very fast, meaning all of the reactions are happening rapidly, really rapidly, the more chemical reactions you have happening, the more heat your body's going to produce. The faster those chemical reactions are happening, the more heat your body's going to produce. So a fast meta metabolism produces lots of heat. Okay. What if you don't have a fast metabolism? What if your metabolism is slow? So those chemical reactions are happening. They're just not happening very fast. You're still going to produce heat. You're still going to produce probably a predictable amount of heat, but it's going to be a lot less than if your metabolism was happening quickly. A slow metabolism produces just a little bit of heat. Okay. All right. All right, so let's follow this through to its conclusion, what we really care about here. If you have a fast metabolism, chemical reactions are happening rapidly, you're producing lots of heat, 
that's going to affect your overall body temperature. Lots of heat means you are going to have a high body temperature. Similarly, if your metabolism is slow, chemical reactions are happening, but they're not happening very fast, you're not producing very much heat, you are going to have a low body temperature. So how does this connect to those two terms I mentioned before? Well, endotherms have a high body temperature because they produce lots of heat. Track that all the way back to the beginning it means they have a fast metabolism. So, they have a high body temperature, Oops. and their metabolism produces all of their body heat. So they're generating their body temperature just through their own metabolism. Now ectotherms are different. Ectotherms have a slow metabolism. Okay. Which means they have a low body temperature most of the time. However, that can be detrimental. Your muscles run on chemical reactions. The speed at which your muscles can operate depend on how fast those chemical reactions are happening. So let's say you're an ectotherm like a lizard and there's a cat coming. That cat is intent on eating you. If you're cold and your body temperature is low, that actually limits how quickly chemical reactions can happen in your body. It's kind of cyclical. If your body's cold, that actually slows down chemical reactions and slow chemical reactions don't produce very much heat so your body stays cold. See how it's kind of cyclical? If your muscles can't move very fast, you as a lizard aren't going to be able to run away from that cat. So it's not good to have a low body temperature all the time. It literally slows you down. However, you can get heat elsewhere. You could go say lay out in the sun or lay on a hot rock or a hot road and absorb heat from your environment. That will elevate your body's temperature and it'll actually slow up the chemicals or uh, speed up the chemical reactions happening in your body, allowing your muscles to move faster and allowing you to run away from that cat. So ectotherms, even though they don't produce very much of their own body heat, they can absorb it from their environment. So they can absorb additional heat or more heat. from their, oops, environment. Look, I called it. That totally looks like a kindergartner's handwriting. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> now, what does this have to do with what we're talking about? Well, interestingly, Vertebrates, you can split up into these two groups, either endotherms or ectotherms. And because, mo because endotherms do form a monophyletic clit, well, I shouldn't say that. There are two clades of endotherms, and uh, ectothermy is actually the ancestral state for vertebrates. There are some commonalities in each group as to what sort of chromatophores you're going to have. Endotherms have mostly what are called melanocytes. Now melanocytes are what we have as well. They're located in the stratum germinativum. So these are actually chromatophores, pigment cells that aren't in the dermis. They contain a pigment called melanin. 
Melanin is brownish, black, or red. It's stored in a special organelle inside of epithelial cells that are called melanosomes. So melanosomes contain melanin, and they're found inside of cells called melanocytes. And they're called melanocytes only in endotherms. The same pigment's gonna be found in ectotherms, but it's found in a different cell type. Now, melanin and melanocytes contribute to what's called morphological color change. Okay, I didn't mean to cross that out, just to highlight it. Morphological color change is slow. Happens over the lifetime of an animal. So when your skin starts out pale when you're young, or say at the end of winter when you've been indoors all day long, over time as you're exposed to the sun, when you go out to the beach and lay out, you get what? a tan, right? Your skin darkens, but it doesn't happen immediately. The only color change you see at the end of a long day in the sun is usually the change to the color red because you've burned yourself. Getting a tan takes days and days or weeks and weeks of sun exposure because your body slowly builds up more and more melanin in your melanocytes. That's morphological color change. It's slow. Now that's in contrast to ectotherms. Now first off, ectotherms have a much greater variety of pigment cells. They have four main types. The first are what are called melanophores. Melanophores are the equivalent of melanocytes in endotherms. They contain melanin. They also have what are called iridophores. Iridophores, think iridescent, shiny. These are really big cells that are filled with crystals, crystalline compounds that reflect light, giving them that iridescence, like what you see here in this little squid. Xanthophores contain yellow pigment. Erythrophores contain red pigment. Remember this prefix, erythro, it means red. We're gonna see it again when we talk about red blood cells, which are called erythrocytes. Now, ectotherms can exhibit morphological color change as well, but more interestingly, they display what's called physiological color change. Physiological color change happens fast. You see this in things like cuttlefish, we can, which can change their coloration instantaneously. You also see it in things like octopus. The cephalopods in general are really notorious for being able to change color patterns rapidly. I'm gonna show you some, or I'll post a couple of videos so you can see exactly what I mean, okay? Happens immediately. And it's because they can actually reorganize where they store their pigment cells, or I'm sorry, their pigment bearing organelles inside of a larger cell. So this big thing, it's kind of sloppy shaped. This is an animal cell. Each of these black dots is a pigment cell. When, or a pigment organelle. When these pigment film filled organelles are spread throughout the cell, the cell appears dark in color, okay? It's filled with pigment. However, these animals can pull all of their pigment cells to the, or all of their pigment organelles to the middle of the cell, clustering them together, causing the majority of the cell to be transparent, giving it a lighter color. And this change can happen instantaneously, going from dark to light to dark. For the rest of this lecture, I'm gonna go a little bit more quickly because most of the information you need is just on the slides. We're gonna start our overview of the integumen found in different groups of vertebrates by starting with the oldest, um, in evolutionary terms, the oldest group, which are the fish. First fish group we need to cover are uh, superclass Agnatha, which are the jawless fish. Remember, these, this includes um, the true classes, class Mixini and class Cephalospidomorphi. Hopefully those sound vaguely familiar from the big animal cladogram we did way back at the start of class. These guys exhibit the ancestral state for the integument in vertebrates. They have a smooth epidermis, meaning there are no scales, and it's covered by this very thin cuticle. The cuticle is waxy. It's made out of fats, 
It's not made out of keratin. In fact, there are there's no keratin in the skin of this group, which is important. It means keratin evolved later. What they do have, though, are a lot of what are called club glands. Club glands are proteinaceous glands. And the way I know that is they produce this fibrous protein slime. Remember, slime is always protein-based. It's always going to come from a proteinaceous gland. And I'll post a video, video for you of just how incredible this slime is. It's produced on the skin as a concentrate, meaning there's a tiny little bit of white goo that's secreted out of the skin. And once it hits the water, because remember these are fish, they're marine, once it hits the water, it magnifies in size by about a thousand times. So a tiny bit suddenly becomes a huge gooey mess. And it's a great defense against predators. The dermis is very fibrous, but also very flexible. What that means is the majority of those fibers are gonna be elastic fibers. Our last two classes of fish are the bony fish and the cartilaginous fish. Classes Osteichthys, the bony fish, and Chondrichthys, the cartilaginous fish. Now, even though I have them listed this way, remember that their evolutionary order is actually the opposite. Chondrichthys are older, Osteichthys are the younger group. These guys have a very thin dermis and a thin epidermis, but they're incredibly glandular, meaning they've got tons of glands that make a lot of different materials. Mucus glands are present in abundance in both groups. That mucus has a lot of different functions. It deters parasites. Nothing really wants to bite the skin of an animal that's covered in mucus. It helps to clean the body. If you pump out a lot of mucus through your skin, it will carry away any dirt that's covering you. And it reduces friction, streamlines you in the water. They also have poison glands. Remember, poison glands are proteinaceous glands. Uh, not all of them have them, though. Only certain fish have poison glands. Lionfish are a good example, which is what you see in the picture here. And keratin exists in some groups, but not in many. It's almost always absent. But these are the first groups that seem to have evolved keratin as an integument material. This is the first place where you see hard integumentary materials show up meaning ones that aren't flexible, they're not soft, and they're also non-living. Enamel, dentinous tissue, and bone are the three that are most common. Enamel is the hardest of those materials. It can't be regrown. It's what covers the surface of your teeth. Dentinous material is, some, is uh, made of a material called dentine. It's softer than enamel. You only see it in vertebrate teeth, a type of scale called a denticle true scales like what you see on fish and reptiles and also any external armor there are armored fish other than the placoderms which are extinct yeah you'll see some examples in a later slide bone isn't just found in the skeleton of osteichthys it can also be found in their scales as well it's actually the weakest of the three materials all right the oldest form of scale, of hard body material that we see in these groups is found in the chondrichthys, and it's called a placoid scale. It's also called a dermal denticle. They're the same things. Placoid scales are dermal denticles and vice versa. You see these in cartilaginous fish, and what's interesting is they're homologous with vertebrate teeth. Remember, homo means same. Homologous structures share the same evolutionary origin means that the teeth that you see in vertebrates actually evolved from placoid scales that were found along the margins of the jaw here and were used by the animals to grind up food. And over time, those scales grew stronger and stronger, larger and larger, and turned into what we now think of as teeth. Placoid scales can still be seen in modern chondrichthys. If you feel the skin of a shark, it has a sandpapery texture. If you look at it under a microscope, you see a series of semi-sharpened bumps. These are the placoid scales, and they cover the skin of the shark, giving it that sandpapery feel. Now, there's a lot of other kinds of scales present in these groups of fish. 
however all of these other scale types are only found in the osteichthyes that's it you don't see them in chondric these chondric these only have those placoid scales okay. all right um, try something here hold on In color, Let's do yellow again. All right. We're going to start with the second oldest group of scales, cosmoid scales. Now, cosmoid scales are likely derived from placoid scales, meaning they evolved from them, but we're not sure. We think this is the case because the surface of the scale is actually covered with little denticles. Denticles are placoid scales. Remember, they're the same thing. So when you look at these cosmoid scales, you see they, they have what look like dots all over the surface. Those are the denticles. Now cosmoid scales have a distinctive shape, and you're going to need to keep track of the shapes of these different scale types. Cosmoid scales are what's called cycloid. Think of a cycle as being something that's round. These are rounded scales, but you don't get to see the whole scale because they overlap each other. Each of these scales as a whole structure is circular, but since they sit on top of each other, you don't see the top half of the circle. That's called being imbricated. Imbricated means overlapping. So where these two scales overlap each other, that's imbrication. Now, they can also be what's called rhomboid in shape. Rhomboids are parallelograms, which means a four sided shape. That was a crappy one here. Let me try that again. There we go. That's better. <laughs> These rhomboid scales, they fit edge to edge, meaning they're not imbricated. They're not overlapping. So the next scale here would look like, not like that, like that. And then there'd be another one here, like so. And then you'd get another layer above them covering the body. There you go. You see these kinds of scales in some lobe-finned fish, such as lungfish. A lobe-finned fish, I can draw a little picture of one for you. There's a top fin, there's a back fin, here's face. Boop. They're called lobe-finned because they have lobe-shaped fins, big and oblong. And what's special about that is inside this fin, there are bones. That's going to be in contrast to another group of fish we'll see in a future slide called teleosts. Teleost fish don't have bones in their fins. Instead, their fins look kind of like this, like what you'd see on a goldfish. That's the bottom of my tablet there, guys. Sorry. I'll draw this again later. Here's its eye, boop, blink, there it is. It's one of these wispy, thin kinds of fins that are transparent and don't have bones in them. Lobe-finned fish have bones that spread throughout this lobe-shaped fin. Okay. Okay. Next type of scale are ganoid scales. They're derived probably from cosmoid scales, which is convenient. They're very thick and they are that rhomboid <coughs> shape. And you can see it here. And there's that parallelogram. Now the difference here between rhomboid shaped cosmoid scales and rhomboid shaped ganoid scales is that in ganoid scales, each rhombus, each parallelogram is connected with what are called peg and socket joints. There is an extension of the scale here that fits into an indentation on its neighbor. So this scale underneath has a socket, a little hole in it. This scale underneath has a peg that fits into that socket and that's how they hold together. Okay. You see this in gars, sturgeon, paddlefish, just sort of a, a, a variety of different fish. You don't have to worry about these examples just yet if you don't want to. Um, you won't be tested on them yet. 
but you do need to know that ganoid scales likely gave rise to our second to last group of scale which are called elasmoid scales elasmoid scales get their name from the fact that they are somewhat flexible unlike every type of scale that came before these have some bendiness to them and they are reasonably soft the reason they can get away with being soft and flexible is because they're thin they're much thinner than our other scale types they are also imbricated which remember means overlapping so you see that here these guys are definitely layered on top of each other they can have either a cycloid shape meaning they are circular rounded or they can be what's called tenoid just pretend the C isn't there, just like when we talked about Nadaria tenophora. Tenoid scales, they're a somewhat rounded scale, but they have this comb-like edge to them, these ridges that stick out from the edge of the scale. Okay? You can see them right here. See all that? All of those are the comb-like edges. So what you're seeing here are actual tenoid scales under a microscope. These are the scales you see in those teleosts I mentioned. Teleosts make up basically almost all living fish, almost all living osteichthyes. They're like your goldfish, beta fish. They have those really soft flowing fins. Okay? They're transparent, they're see-through, they're very elegant. Those are teleosts. Many living lungfish also have these kinds of scales, as well as coelacanths, those ancient fish that we thought were extinct and yet showed up about 50 years ago, looking virtually unchanged from their fossils. Okay. They are a classic example of evolutionary stasis. All right, next up, scoots. Scoots are these g large, thick, shield-like scales. They can take several forms. They can be these bony plates. They can be thick and keeled. Keeled meaning they have this shape in cross sections. You see how this goes up and then comes back down. They can be spiny, have points to them. They can also project off the body into spines, like what you see on a lionfish. Now that's it for our fish. Now we can move on to amphibians. Now what I want you to pay attention to here is remember that amphibians were the first of the vertebrates to transition onto land, but they didn't make a full transition. And the reason is their eggs still have to be laid in water, otherwise they dry out and die. Reptiles were able to bridge that gap. They're the first group to have that amniotic egg, which has a waterproof shell, meaning the egg can be laid on land without drying out and dying. Amphibians don't have amniotic eggs. They also don't have a lot of the other adaptations reptiles have, which allow them to live on land all the time, which is why most amphibians are tied to wet environments or have to live near a body of water. Amphibians are similar to fish in that they have a thin epidermis. Oftentimes amphibian epidermis is less than eight cells thick and only the outermost single layer of cells is the stratum corneum, is actually that waterproof layer of keratin. It's not much protection against drying out. It is also frequently replaced. Remember, epidermal cells are constantly growing, so that outermost cell layer of stratum corneum is constantly being lost, a process called sloughing in amphibians. It peels away and is immediately replaced. Now, amphibians have a variety of pretty awesome uh, types of glands. They have a special gland called an alveolar gland. Uh, alveolar gland secretions produce mucus, tons and tons of mucus, which is what gives frogs and other amphibians their shiny appearance. That plus the keratin found in that thin stratum corneum is what prevents desiccation or drying out keeps them from um, drying out while exposed to the open air. That mucus from the alveolar glands also helps to clean the skin. Uh, so as mucus is constantly produced, it pushes dirt off of the skin, which is important since these guys perform cutaneous respiration. Part of their oxygen comes from gas exchange right through their skin. 
they also have granular glands granular glands produce toxins by and large their mucus glands they're distasteful they can even be dangerous to some animals and a good example they are clustered in the warts that you see behind the eyes of toads if you ever make a toad really angry a milky substance will come out of these big warts behind their eyes don't lick it you won't get high you'll just get sick just trust me what you're going to see next in the integument of reptiles are adaptations that allow the animals to live fully in the open air and be very very resistant to drying out their epidermis is completely composed of horny scales that are fused to each other so there are no gaps between these scales this is a single continuous layer of incredibly thick keratin joints like at the arms here or in their digits their toes joints where the body has to bend is where you find areas of thinness in the skin otherwise it would be like the animal was wearing a suit of armor where all the pieces were fused together you wouldn't be able to bend any of your limbs the material of their skin has to be thinner at the joints so that it can deform and bend their skin has a ton of keratin and lipids remember which are fats which waterproof the skin traps water inside which is where you want to keep it they don't have any mucus glands because they don't need to keep their skin moist it's designed to be dry they do though have scent glands scent glands are used for marking territory mm -hmm. for example you find them under the jaws of crocodiles you'll see crocs in the wild rubbing their chins on fallen logs or rocks in their territory and they're literally scent marking that territory just like dogs do now reptiles also molt just like amphibians but they do it differently. Amphibians slough their skin in patches every couple of days. Reptiles perform true molting, which like in insects, is when an entire generation of epidermis is lost at once as a whole unit. The resting phase is what happens in between molts. Now, there are two layers of the skin that are involved in molting, the outer epidermal generation layer and the inner epidermal generation layer. The outer layer sits above the stratum germinativum, that growth layer of the skin. The stratum germinativum is then going to produce additional layers of epidermis that will grow between the outer epidermal and the germinativum itself. So what you wind up with is what looks kind of like a layer cake. So up here, this is the outer epidermal generation. Then in here, here, there's your inner epidermal generation, and then down here is your stratum germinativum. So the stratum germinativum is constantly pushing up new layers of tissue, like this inner epidermal generation. So when the outer epidermal generation gets old and it's time for it to go, it will fall off and the inner epidermal generation will move up and take its place. And then a new layer will grow down here, pushing the inner epidermal generation up and up and up until it becomes old and also has to fall off. Okay. All right, a couple of interesting things about integument in this group. You have scoots, just like you did in fish. The scoots of crocodilians often form spines along their backs. And the scoots of chelonians, which is the name of the clade that contains both turtles and tortoises, are the plates that make up their shells. In both cases, the scoots are made of thick keratin that builds up over time and doesn't actually fall away from the body. So as these animals molt, each molt <coughs> leaves behind a layer of keratin so if you were to look at one of these scoots from the side you see all these little individual lines each of these represents a layer of keratin that was laid down by a molting event so from the side the scoot looks like this 
and each of these lines is a layer of keratin that was created when the rest of the animal's skin molted. Okay. New layers are added from the bottom, forcing the structure to grow upwards, and growth and wear, I'm sorry, uh, growth um, of these keratin layers has two functions. You need to add new layers when the animal gets bigger, because otherwise you would get gaps between the scales. These scoots have to grow larger as the animal does so that there aren't holes left behind in the shell. And also, see how these things are kind of peaked in shape? It's because they wear away over time. The oldest layers up here, that's all that's left of them. The rest has been worn away. All right. The integument of birds evolved directly from the integument of reptiles. Birds, unlike reptiles though, have very thin skin and it's only weakly keratinized. What that means is in the epidermis itself, there isn't very much uh, keratin. Instead, all the keratin is found in their feathers, which are offshoots of the skin. The epidermis is also really loosely attached to the tissue underneath. That's to allow for it to move during flight when the feathers are being pulled one way or another by the wind. If the skin wasn't loose and mobile, the feathers would just be ripped right out. So the skin has to be flexible so that feathers can change position during flight to keep the bird in the air. Now their legs and toes show their ancestry. Right? They're covered in horny scales or scoots, and they're not shed. So that is different from uh, reptiles. These are not molted. Okay. The beak is also a heavily keratinized structure that grows from the dermis and is then fused to the skull. It's attached to the skull, but it grows from the dermis. Now, birds have a very unique and very important gland. You can see it here and here. This is called the uropigial gland, uropigial. It's found above the base of the tail, and its critical function is it secretes oil that's used in a process called preening. Preening is the process of keeping the feathers clean. Oil is used to, um, or oil from the gland is spread over the feathers and it helps strip away dirt and parasites. Now this oil is also great for waterproofing, which is why this gland is the most derived, meaning it's the biggest, in water birds, which are most in need of waterproofing their feathers. Now, feathers may have evolved from reptilian scales, but we're not sure. What you need to know about them is that there are four different types. Contour, flight feathers, Flight feathers are only found on the wing and tail. Down feathers, and what are called bristles. Molting of the feathers occurs once or twice per year, and it only happens one feather at a time. Now that doesn't mean that one feather falls off and then a week later, another feather falls off. What it means is that the bird doesn't molt all of its feathers in one day. You won't see a chicken walking along and then suddenly poof, all of its feathers fly off and it's left naked. That would not be, again, very adaptive. The bird would probably die. Birds have to ensure that their body remains covered with feathers. Mm -hmm. So they'll only molt a few of them at a time. And they'll only molt them once new feathers are already in place and ready to take the position of the old feathers. Now contour feathers are what cover the external body they provide streamlining during flight, they also display color, and they provide protection from the environment. Flight feathers are significantly bigger and stiffer. They're used to control flight. You only find them in the wings and the tail. Contour and flight feathers have a very distinctive structure that's important to understand. They, grow, they anchor to the body down here uh, I can't draw down to it, I apologize. Down there, here I'll use the mouse. There we go, all right. This is called the calamus. It's also called a quill. It's the hollow portion of the feather that embeds in the skin. It's also where all the blood vessels are. This is the growth point of the feather. 
We call this the proximal end of the feather. Proximal means close to the body. So anything close to the body is referred to as proximal. The opposite side of the feather we call the distal end because it's distant, distant from the body. It's solid and narrow. This section is called the rachis, the rachis. Connected to the rachis is what you would think of probably as the feathery part of the feather. That's called the vein. So this whole blue area, all of this is referred to as the vein. The vein is made up of smaller structures, these guys, which are called barbs. Barbs in turn are made up of smaller structures here, okay, which are called barbules. And barbules are covered in tiny little hooks that are called hooklets. Hooklets are what hold adjacent barbs to each other. So the hooklets on these barbules here, okay, these barbules are these, they would grab onto the hooklets on these barbules, anchoring the two barbs to each other. Down feathers are very different in structure and in function from contour or flight feathers. They have almost no shaft. Now shaft is another word for ratchets. All they're made of are long barbs, mm -hmm. very, very long barbs. Mm -hmm. There are no hooklets on them, mm -hmm. meaning the barbs don't stick to mm -hmm. each other. The function of down feathers is to insulate the body and conserve body heat. So warm air is trapped between these long barbs and held close to the body. You only really find down feathers underneath larger feathers, lining the skin, keeping the animal warm. All right. Bristles are the other interesting kind of feather you need to know about. Bristles are very short, they're stiff, and they have few or no barbs. So essentially a bristle, like this guy, is all ratchets, all ratchets, no barbs. Down feathers, on the other hand, are all barbs and no ratchets. Bristles are really interesting. They have the same function in some cases as eyelashes. So they screen dirt from the eyes to keep the bird's eyes clear or nose hairs. So they keep dirt from um, flying up their nostrils. And interestingly too, they can be used to increase the width of the beak. So when this animal opens its mouth, it has this much space to capture bugs that are flying around out here. So as it's shooting forward through the air, if there's a bug right here, when it opens its mouth, it'll be able to catch it. But if that bug is out here, it'll miss it. These bristles though, when this bug gets caught in these bristles, they push the bug in towards the mouth, helping the bird to capture more food, basically increasing the total area it has in which to capture bugs and capture food. All right, last but not least, we've got mammals. Remember, mammals did not evolve from birds. They also evolved from reptiles. So what you're gonna see is a slightly different take on how you can take the reptile or uh, the integument of a reptile and tweak it to have a slightly different function. Now, mammals, one distinctive thing about their integument is they have a very thick dermis, that deeper layer of integumentary tissue. It's actually the source of leather. So your leather bags or wallets that's made of dermis. Now the epidermis is very reactive to um, abuse, basically. The epidermis will thicken in bare areas, meaning areas that aren't covered by fur, and any ones and any areas that are exposed to pressure or abrasion. So think the foot pads of an animal or their hooves. Foot pads will develop thick, horny skin over time, as will the bottoms of our feet. We we'll call them calluses. Calluses are a thickening of the epidermis in response to abrasion or to pressure, and it helps protect that part of the body. A couple of associated integumentary structures. Claws down here, 
They are strong, highly keratinized extensions of the epidermis, as are hooves. Hooves, interestingly, likely evolved from claws. Mammals have a number of interesting glands. Some of them are unique just to this clade. They have scent glands, which aren't unique. You find those in a lot of vertebrates. They use them for defense, think of a skunk. Also for recognition, like when dogs sniff each other's butts, they are smelling their scent glands. And also in mating. So uh, cats often spray a very scent heavy liquid around their uh, territory when they're ready to mate and it advertises that readiness. Mm -hmm. Glands that are unique to mammals are things like sweat glands. They produce a salty water that's responsible for cooling. They've been lost in mammals that returned to the water. So aquatic mammals like whales and manatees, they used to be terrestrial. They used to live on land. As they returned back to the water, they lost a lot of structures they didn't need anymore, including sweat glands. Mammals also have sebaceous glands. They secrete an oil that coats the skin and the hair, helps to keep it waterproof and clean, also soft. And mammary glands, where mammals get their name from. Mammary glands produce milk that's meant to suckle young, to provide them with nutrition. The nipple is an elevated outer opening of the gland, and it's present in all mammals except the platypus and the echidna. Hair has a really obscure evolutionary origin. Unlike feathers, it's probably not derived from scales, probably didn't evolve from them. Um, you can actually see hair co-occurring with scales. Beavers are a great example. Their tail is covered in scales, body's covered in hair. The functions of hair, though, are very similar to the functions of feathers, aside from the flight uh, function of feathers. Hair provides protection from the environment and insulation. There are four different types of hair. The first are guard hairs. Guard hairs are long hairs that give the fur color and texture. So when you see the brown color of this beaver, these long hairs, these are all guard hairs. They can be specialized to serve different functions depending on the environment the animal lives in. For example, beavers have guard hairs that are incredibly streamlined, and so they shed water meaning water doesn't get absorbed past the guard hairs and the base of the animal's fur doesn't get wet. Helps to keep them warm. Next up, we have what's called underfur. Underfur does the same job as down in birds. Underfur is short, it's numerous, and it's used for insulation. It's also very soft. Does the same thing that down does in birds. Whiskers are very coarse hairs like what you see here on this cat. Notice that the whiskers are found not just on the cheeks, but also around the lips and the eyes. These whiskers are attached directly to nerves in the skin. They're touch organs, sensory organs. They help a cat detect uh, the area immediately around its face. There is another type of hair. This is a weird one. These are called quills. Quills are heavy, hollow, and stiff, very stiff. They're used for protection. Think what you see on a hedgehog. Each of these guys is a quill. Okay. Um, or porcupines. Porcupines are the other classic quill. Or they have the other classic form of quill. Molting in this group, it's kind of similar to birds. It happens once or twice a year. Um, all the fur doesn't just fall off the animal at once, so they're running around naked. Uh, fur is molted a little at a time and only when there is replacement fur ready to grow in. Okay. The kind of fur that grows in is dependent on the season. Okay. There is a winter coat that will grow in thick or a summer coat that will grow in thinner, depending on what the animal needs, whether to conserve a lot of heat or to be able to get rid of heat. Some associated integumentary structures are what are our uh, horns or antlers, and horns and antlers are very different. Horns are non-branching. What that means is the horn is one single continuous piece, okay? So that, that's a terrible horn. That's not much better, but you get the idea here. Let me try that one more time. Hey, there we go. 
That's a horn. One long piece, no branches, no splits. You see horns in cattle, sheep, and goats. Those horns are bony in the middle, meaning the core of this horn right in the center is bone tissue. It's vascularized, so there are blood vessels inside of this horn as well. It's covered in a hardened epidermal layer that can be made of a variety of materials, sometimes keratin, sometimes dentine, uh, sometimes it's non-living compact bone. Okay. Horns grow from the inside out, so they grow from the center outwards and also away from the head. Rhinos, the rhinoceros, has a slightly different kind of horn. Their horns are not made of bone. Okay, cattle, sheep, and goats have got a bony horn. Rhinos don't. Instead, this is a solid mass of keratin. It's the same material that your fingernails and your hair are made out of. Remember, we're mammals. This is hair, okay? It's made of keratin. So are your fingernails. Uh, these horns, they grow upwards from the epidermal layer, so new layers get added to the bottom of the horn, forcing it to grow up and up. Okay? Now, keep in mind, rhinos are poached for their horns. These horns are taken from their bodies. They are oftentimes ground up into a powder that is used as a medicine to treat things like erectile dysfunction. So the inability for a guy to get an erection. This is the equivalent of collecting fingernails from a whole bunch of people, grinding them up, and treating erectile dysfunction with that powder. You probably wouldn't do that because you know it wouldn't work. There's nothing structurally different between the material in your nails and your hair and the materials in that rhino horn. There's no reason they should be poached for it. Now, giraffes and okapis, they also have horns. Okay, here they are. These two little guys up top. These are a special kind of horn called an ossicone. Ossicones are made of bone, so these grow right out of the skull but they're covered by skin. They're covered by hair and fur, or I'm sorry, skin and fur. And you can see it here, okay? So again, all of these are horns, but there are three very different types of horn. Okay, the last associated structure, antlers. Antlers differ from horns in that the antlers branch, okay? So think of like deer's antlers or um, antelope antlers or these moose, if they've got these branching shapes to them, they're an antler and not a horn. Okay. Antlers are actually bony extensions that grow from the dermis and they grow in each year and are then shed at the end of each year. And the reason is antlers are used during mating. Males fight with each other using their antlers. Whoever has the nicest set of antlers tends to win the most fights and mate with the most females. Antlers, though, are a crap weapon. They're a terrible weapon for self-defense. They're ungainly. You can't actually look when you're using them, so you're just sort of charging blindly at something. And if you're trying to run away from a predator, like a wolf, through the forest, it's not great to have a chandelier on your head. It's going to catch on branches and trunks of trees, and it's going to slow you down. So once males don't need those antlers anymore because mating season is over, they drop them. They fall right off and then they just grow back the next year. During the growth period when the antlers are developing, they're actually covered by skin as they grow from the head. We call that living skin velvet because it's covered in this very short, fine fur that's really, really soft. It feels like velvet. Once the antlers are full-sized, so growth is over, circulation to the velvet is cut off by the body and the velvet is sloughed meaning it's shed, it falls right off. Okay. This is an example of velvet that is being molted from this now mature antler. Now this velvet is made of blood vessels, there's fat in there, there's dermis and epidermis, there's a lot of good materials that are valuable. It took a lot of energy to grow those antlers and it took a lot of energy, calories and materials to grow this velvet. So in order to try to salvage some of that energy, animals will often eat the velvet, try to salvage some of the energy that they invested in growing these antlers 
and uh, save those calories. It's a little gross. The antler then again is shed at the end of the breeding season. All right, that's it for part two of Integumen. Let me know if you have any questions.